It's good to see you, for us to be gathered here for worship today on this uh, brisk morning. I'm Scott Kennedy, one of the pastors here at the church. Uh, it's, it's great to welcome you here. Uh, those who are present or joining us online, uh, great to, to be together today. Um, uh, uh, just a couple of uh, announcements to lift up, as, as some of you probably noticed uh, uh, the fire uh, department here. Uh, a person uh, coming in for worship uh, fell as they were getting out of their car. A uh, little scuffed up. They're okay. They're going to take uh, her to the, the hospital just to be checked out. Um, actually, uh, Helen Wingert is her name, if you want to uh, hold her in your, your prayers. Uh, she was going to be, and her husband, John, were going to be joining the church this morning. So oh. they uh, said, um, oh. we'll just have to wait a week. So, <laughs> But she's okay. Um, you know, it appears to be, and, and uh, just going to be uh, cautious to make sure. So uh, we want to be thinking of them. Uh, also this morning, um, I got to sleep in an extra hour because Tim is going to be preaching this morning. <laughs> yeah. Tim. <laughs> you didn't tell me you were going to do that. You know? <laughs> Now, you know, Tim's our uh, music director here at the church, and uh, this past year commissioned as a deacon in the, in the church, uh, United Methodist Church. But so he's in this kind of, back when I was in it, they called a probationary period. Now they're nicer. They say you're commissioned, but until you're ordained. So each year he's going to need to do different things to prepare for the Board of Ordained Ministry. One of those is to turn in a, uh, a sermon. So that's his job for today. Uh, you get the joy of being able to be here with him as he does. So uh, we're uh, keeping him and all of us in our prayers this morning, right? Yeah. And uh, also we uh, continue to do the, the uh, support for Skyline Urban Ministries uh, program to help kids to have uh, a great Christmas this year. There's a display out here where you can pick out items that you would like to help provide for that and uh, can pick them up and bring them here to the church, and then they'll uh, be taken to Skyline, where families will be able to come through, parents will be able to come through and help select items that they want to be able to, to give to their children this year. So I uh, want to thank you for your support of that already and encourage you to go find some way to, to help contribute this year. Uh, those are our announcements. As we are gathered here, let us open our hearts our minds, our spirits to God's presence with us today and to the spirit of this community that we may embrace this moment that God has given us.
If you will please join me in the call to worship. For the greeting of trees and the gentling of friends, we thank, we thank you, God. God. For the brightness of field and the warmth of the sun, we, we thank, thank you, God. God. For the work to be done and laughter to share, we, we thank, thank you, God. God. And know that through struggle and pain in the slippery path of new birth, hope will be born and all shall be well. I invite you to be seated and let us join together in the congregational prayer. <coughs> Gracious God, for your love for us, gentle as a shower, healing our pain, binding our wounds, we give you thanks. For love for us, sure as the dawn transforming our darkness, revealing our truth, we give you thanks. For your love for us, encouraging questions, open to doubts, making us vulnerable, we give you thanks. Urge us on to find wholeness through serving you and serving others in the power of your spirit. And let us pray. Gracious creator, may we act to help bring peace here on earth Jesus calls us to follow in his way. May we proclaim him the way of our lives. You assure us that you will not leave us alone. With that confidence, 
may we become bold in our faith. When we are confronted with poverty, give us the courage to act to free those who want. When we are aware of the lonely, let us be quick to provide comfort and companionship. When others face death, may our presence bring courage and help to fill the void. Where pain hinders movement, give us compassion to console those afflicted. As the shoot springs forth from the stump, let us and our actions cause it to break out into blossom, that all who hear of your love may come to rejoice with new life. Amen. And now let us pray together as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. struggling. Show me what I have to be thankful for. Our next hymn is Seek Ye First. Let us stand and join together in singing.
Good morning. Today's scripture is one of the lectionary texts actually for Thanksgiving and comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 25 through 33. As you hear the scripture today, I would like to highlight that these verses are set within a greater section in Matthew's Gospel, being the Sermon on the Mount, all which are parts of seek different instructions for how to best live in a way that seeks the kingdom. If I wanted to take my opportunity to preach every you know, few years when I do this for the board, I could expand the scripture all the way through and keep you here till three o'clock. <laughs> However, nonetheless, as you hear the scripture today, know that other popular concepts within the Sermon on the Mount include the Beatitudes, the Golden Rule, and the Lord's Prayer. Hear the word of the Lord from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 25 through 33. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. This is the word of the Lord. So when I was preparing to preach today, I checked our lectionary calendar for available passages for today, which is actually Christ the King Sunday, notice the white. And that also represents the end of the church lectionary year before Advent starts next week. And then I also checked what lectionary passages were available for Thanksgiving on Thursday. When I came across this worrying passage from Matthew, Specifically, to not worry about what you should wear, I had a bit of a laugh. For I learned that sometimes we do have great irony. I understand many of you probably have no idea what I'm talking about, so I'll try to put some things in context for you. The date was August 22nd of this past summer. If you were here, you might remember it as the day the air conditioner went out. If you are not here, you can still find the service on our Facebook videos and YouTube page. <laughs> our senior pastor, Scott Canada, said, due to the heat and how uncomfortable we all are, we're going to take off our choir and clergy robes today. The choir was thrilled, for I think they were ready to hightail it and phone in their vocal parts into the service. <laughs> However, my response was, no, I don't dress well underneath my robe. <laughs> Scott looked at me and said, well, you're wearing something, right? <laughs> I said, yes, but I'm not comfortable disclosing it. <laughs> However, Scott replied, whatever it is, I'm sure they'll understand. We don't need anyone passing out. So, well, um, The Batman organist has since been the punchline to many jokes. I have received a paper fan the next week. Thank you, choir. I also received a Batman cartoon. Thank you, Larry. You want to look at that closer, you can see it after the service. And believe it or not, I even received money to buy more Batman clothing. 
People certainly had a lot of fun with this, but not everyone. I did have a choir member come up after the service and say, all of us robe wearers take heart in Jesus' message of worry not about what you wear, but in your case, I would worry a little more if I were you. <laughs> Nonetheless, three months later, here I am attempting to preach about how we shouldn't worry about what, you, what we wear, and it's okay if you're thinking, I guess we shouldn't worry, obviously Tim doesn't. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, if we expand today's text to include all of the Sermon on the Mount, we would find more passages similar to this one. It begins in Matthew 5 with the Beatitudes and continues through chapter 7 with concepts relating to how we should live and order our lives. Some of these other concepts include anger, adultery, retaliation, love for enemies, prayer, this one on worry, judging others, and the golden rule. These concepts begin when Jesus goes up the mountain to deliver the Beatitudes. For Matthew, this is a movement which recalls Moses' going up the mountain to receive the law of the Ten Commandments. Now it is Jesus who goes up the mountain representing the fulfillment of the law. These ideas flow through Matthew 5 and 6 until we get to today's scripture, which concludes with Jesus' main direction for how to live and what to focus on. Strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. When considering the first half of today's scripture regarding worrying, we find Jesus' articulation to be that worrying about earthly things, such as what we wear or eat, is pointless and holds us back from doing kingdom work or seeking first God's righteousness. The message seems to be simple. Seek God, trust in God, and do not worry. I would suspect that to some degree or another, most people are worriers. My wife, for the longest time, has had her Facebook cover photo being a picture of dandelion seeds blowing in the wind with a caption of whatever will be, will be. More than likely, that motto is difficult for most of us, and if we are honest, we probably have difficulty dealing with the uncertainty of not letting go of what we think should be. My father, who is probably going to be watching this service in the near future, often categorized me as a child as a warrior. Now my dad has this like entire repertoire of words and phrases that often were not a part of what we would call regular society's vocabulary. And to this day, I struggle with which words or phrases are real and which ones are ones he made up. My dad often called me a worrywart. Is, is that a thing? Have any of you heard that before? Okay, good. The universal truth platform, known as Google, <laughs> says worrywart is defined as a person who tends to dwell unduly on difficulty or troubles. Worrywart was not the only title my dad gave me. He also said, I tended to make mountains out of molehills. Now, is that a thing? Okay. Obviously, the implication here is that one takes a small problem and makes it an enormous problem when it doesn't need to be. Jesus tells us in Matthew that worrying will not add a single moment to our lives. There are some beautiful images in today's passage that relate to the idea of my wife's Facebook cover photo, caption of whatever will be, will be. The scripture says, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, will he not much more clothe you? This passage directs us to a clear reality. Do not worry. God will take care of you. So then why do we worry? When considering this for my own life, the main idea I kept coming back to is because I don't have what I think I need or what earthly desires are necessary for what I want my life to be. Does this sound like any of you? Notice here that these earthly possessions are born out of a need to have something or to be equal to the possessions of someone else or society, 
or born out of a need to have some form of perceived status. I also notice that none of these things are because I'm seeking first God's kingdom and his righteousness. These are things that are there because I want it or because it's not fair that someone else gets to have it and I don't. The idea of jealousy towards others is a common feeling that tends to exasperate the problem of always needing more. How many of you maybe even felt that today while watching the video? When the title comes across the bottom of the screen saying, I can be thankful for owning a car. Did anyone think, well, I don't own one. Perhaps we might have thought that about something else in the video that we should be thankful for. John Wesley wrote a series of sermons all about the Sermon on the Mount. In his eighth discourse on the Sermon on the Mount, Wesley explains matters relating to Matthew 6, 19 through 21, which reads, do not store up for yourself treasures on heaven, but store up for yourselves treasures, or I said that backwards, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven. Wesley asserts that to live in a mode of constantly not having enough, needing more than what has been provided, or needing more of this earth than the corner of it given to you, is to live in an open habitual denial of what the Lord has brought us. So I know myself and perhaps some of you might now start feeling a little guilty. Everyone struggles with this needing possession in one way or another, and I don't think or intend to have this sermon pointing into a call of action to stop buying so much stuff that probably would not be particularly effective. And if it is, I may have businesses lining me up to sue me for lost profit. <laughs> I think that this text in Matthew teaches us that gratitude is more powerful than resentment, that we don't need to have the most stuff or look the nicest, and that material things born out of our desires to claim status in society are unnecessary. Instead, do not worry about needing to look the nicest, about needing to have more possessions. Instead, seek to live according to the kingdom by living and acting upon what the Lord requires of us. And above all else, be thankful for what the Lord has provided for us, giving thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. While in my program at Duke, one third of every semester was dedicated to spiritual formation and development. This was primarily a program I did remotely while I was here in Oklahoma. We routinely had devotions and practices we needed to journal and reflect on weekly. One day, my practice for the day centered around gratitude. The devotion for the day was practiced with a prayer that I needed to pray at the beginning of the day and throughout the day, Lord, help me to see your generosity in all things today. To keep this message fresh in my mind, I would put it as the wallpaper on my phone screen so that every time I opened my phone, I would see it and be reminded. After praying this prayer, I left home to go to church. Started driving, and shortly after that, I had some nice flashing red and blue lights in my rear view mirror. <laughs> now the police officer was very nice. I mean, he just let me go. He told me that I needed to update my driver's license because it was still my Virginia license from before we moved here. So I prayed, Lord, help me to see your generosity in everything. I prayed it in thanksgiving for the blessing of having the ability to drive and for a police officer that did not even give me a ticket. As a matter of fact, he didn't even do any checking on me or typing my license into his computer. He just simply said, please get it updated. So later that day, I went to the DMV to update my license, at which point I learned that I did not even have a valid driver's license. <laughs> Long story short, I had a very minor traffic violation in Virginia, which I had paid just a few days late, causing them to put a hold on my license. So I had two options, call the Virginia DMV and prove to them over the phone that all fines had been paid and they could release my hold, 
or I could retake the driver's test here in Oklahoma. <laughs> now, I, I can't imagine that too many of us would opt for being on hold at a DMV that's on the other side of the country. So I chose to opt for number two. So I started right there by taking the written portion of the test. I thought, I got this. This is going to be easy. I know what a red octagon with STOP means. So they gave me the test, told me it's 20 questions, and you can only get four wrong. I quickly learned the questions were not about red octagons or how fast do you go when you see speed limit 55. Instead, I received questions like, when do you use your directional before turning? 100 feet, 200 feet, 300 feet, or 400 feet? I had no idea. I guessed and was wrong. I proceeded to get three out of my first five questions wrong, leaving me only one left. I, I actually began to cry. But you know, I saw that note on my phone that said, Lord, help me to see your generosity and everything. So kind of reluctantly, I prayed a prayer of thanksgiving for having the ability to retake a driver's test and knowing that if I fail, I can study and try again. Remarkably, after that, I was able to settle down and get the last 15 questions correct and pass. <laughs> then the DMV told me that in order to take the behind the wheel test, you must arrive at the DMV around 6 a.m. on Saturday, get in line for a test, and wait roughly four to six hours until it's your turn. And if you fail, you can try again in two weeks. Oh my goodness, I thought, now I truly feel like I'm 16 again. How can this be happening? I asked the teller if I had been driving illegally all this time in Oklahoma, as to which of the answer was, of course, well, yes, you were. Lord, help me to see your generosity and everything. However, if that generosity could include a messenger telling me everything will be okay and a million dollars, that would be great. <laughs> I suspect that all of us would have a story similar to this, a day when everything just seemed to be working against you. But truthfully, committing to praying that prayer throughout that day did put a little bit of a different perspective on it for me. It helped me to be thankful, even if it was reluctantly so, it helped me to be a little more self-aware and have a little more understanding as to who is on my left and who is on my right, what their experiences or circumstances might be. And it really, in some ways, made me worry about it all just a little bit less. When I was preparing for today, relentlessly reading the passages in Matthew to figure out what I might say, I eventually found myself pondering what may have caused Matthew's portrayal of Jesus in this story to articulate the things he did regarding worrying. Imagine Jesus goes to the mountain, speaks the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the merciful, the peacemakers. Store up treasures in heaven instead of earth. Do not worry. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I would imagine these were said because they were problems among the people in the community. <laughs> Jesus returned to the mountain now, what would he say? Might he suggest that some of these things we really haven't gotten any better at? Or maybe some of them we have. Do we live a life in gratitude without worrying about having or being enough? Do we consider the simple blessings of each day without only being angry considering those things that are perceived problems for us? I think one of the best ways to move forward is to consider verse 33 and its implication in our lives Strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And then I thought a little bit about another scripture, Micah 6, verse 8. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness 
and to walk humbly with your God. Indeed, what does the Lord require of you? To seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness.
Let us join together in our prayer of brokenness and confession. Together in worship, O God, we face what we might not face alone, that we are greedy but fail to love our bodies, that we are selfish but fail to love ourselves, that we are lazy but fail to work for peace, that we are human but fail to love the earth. These we share in silence as we remember our own faults and failings. God of the turning tide, change us from the energy we're, or change us so the energy of your forgiveness flows into bold and joyful action, into humility, which is not defeatism, into the strength and confidence to be vulnerable. Amen. Let us stand now and join together in our affirmation of faith. Thanks be to you, awesomely distant God. We give thanks for the shooting stars, for the colors of the planets in the night sky, the space and power beyond our perceiving, which sparkles the sky and ice and ocean. We speak to you, God, uncomfortably close, giving life to dead, dry things, the dance of pure stillness, the beat of our heart is in your name. Thanks be to you, God. No, God, who us in spirit, who raised us to life, gathered in one, reaching out for your kingdom. I invite you to be seated, and as the ushers come forward, I just want to remind you that uh, if you cannot be here today and want to give, uh, you can also give by sending a check to the church, and you can also text uh, what you choose to give today. Let us pray. God of majesty and power, you have dominion over all the universe. And yet you chose to rule not in power, but in love. The gifts we give to you are in the deepest gratitude for all your blessings that keep us and sustain us. May our whole lives reflect to the world that there's one who rules with us and rules us with compassion and love. In the name of your son, the Christ, we pray. Amen.
Our closing hymn this morning is now Thank We All Our God, number 102. If there's anyone this morning who would wish to join the church, we would be glad to welcome you into our church family. I'll meet you down front as we sing this hymn. Don't think that uh, those of you who get your hymnal out to sing from every time, that the mask hid the smug look that I could see on your faces. You know? <laughs> Technology fails us sometimes. It reminded me of Bishop Cannon whenever I was in seminary. Um, he, he would not learn the new hymns, but all the old hymns. He would hold his hymnal to his chest like this and sing them without opening his hymnal. <laughs> I couldn't quite do that on every verse of this one, but pretty close. <laughs> Let us join together in our sending forth. Let thanksgiving continue every day you live. Find joy in the wonder of God's generosity. We will be glad and rejoice in our God. We seek to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Christ leads us toward knowledge of God's truth. The worth, our worth is affirmed in the joy of discipleship. Our prayers of thanksgiving will continue. We will lift up our intercessions for others. All, all humankind dwells as God's family on earth. All creation partakes of the abundance God provides. We are stewards of all these blessings. We seek justice that all might benefit. Amen. Amen. 